Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, the show where we chat about bike stuff. I'm Francis, this is Jimmy. How are you? I'm quite tired this week, Francis. You moved house. I've had a very busy week. Mm -hmm. A bazillion things have happened. We launched some Atticus stuff. I've moved house, or in the process of moving house. We're planning a monumentally epic video series, which we're starting to film later this week, and then over the weekend and into next week. It's been it's been busy. Mm -hmm. It's busy. How about you? Yeah, I'm enjoying most of the contents of your old house being inside the studio right now. Yeah, there's a fair bit. Wow. You wouldn't believe how moved. much is still in storage. But the audio sounds great now. It does, yeah. It has helped. It has helped. Uh, it's also hay fever season. It's it's kind of like weaned off a little bit, <sighs> but it's 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 going to be bad over the next couple mm. of days, just as we're... I've chatted to Nick about this. He was saying, um, mechanic we work with, people don't understand how serious hay fever is because it honestly takes you out of action for full days. Mm. You have to take so, like some serious medication to deal with it. I find it, it makes you sleepy. The non-drowsy ones make you drowsy. Doesn't make sense. Those. I find it quite odd how we ha always have hay fever at exactly the same time. However, our hay fever is very different. I get like the symptoms. Devil eyes. Yeah. My eyes just like itch and go all like horrible and gammy, and I can't touch them. Yeah. But then your eyes are fine, but then you sneeze five billion times a day. Yeah. Mm. It's not like no normal sneeze is three, isn't it? That must be the average. Well, and three sneezes. Normal is one, occasionally two. Nah, three. Okay, come in threes. Not, not Sneezing comes in threes. No, twos. You're an alien. Or Emily, and they come in about 15. Well, maybe she constantly has hay fever. I also am an alien. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you you look sometimes, not all the time, maybe it's when you shave. Like, you know, there's an alien in Men in Black 1 where his a, a robot exoskeleton, his face opens. Yeah. Spoilers, spoiler alert, guys. Skip forwards if you don't want to know what happens in Men in Black. There's a tiny alien inside his head controlling. It looks like you. That is outrageously offensive. To the alien? To me. Oh, well. And on that note... <laughs> into the podcast. <laughs> this week's debrief. The plant that is in front of us, in, in between us, has been named by our audience. There were some brilliant suggestions, but there was one that stood out drastically from the rest. Yep. And it's cycling related. Mm -hmm. Marco Plantani. Marco Plantani. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the podcast. Well, you were always there. He's now been born. You just weren't named. Yeah. Uh, that was suggested by Last Lap Leader 26, or at least he was, it was actually suggested by a lot of people, but that one had the most thumbs up. So I'm going to assume that was, it was the obvious choice. I think it was I'm sad that we didn't come up with it. But yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for all your suggestions. But I think we should get him a pot which matches Marco Pantani, his bike. We should get him a yellow pot with a pirate on it. Or maybe we should see if Rich Mitch can do us a oh, Pantani head. Pantani head. Because I used to have a Pantani mug, which was a Rich Mitch mug. Which we know he's listening. So we'll have to get a, you know, Rich, a Rich, Rich Mitch. Rich Mitch. Um, what's it called? Plant pot. It's called a plant pot. <laughs> <It's hard. laughs> You're really tired. <laughs> it is called a plant pot. Yes. First bit of news, quite close to home, there was a big crash in Ilkley Crit, which is a bike race in Ilkley in England. <laughs> and one of our friends crashed, and he. we've just posted a video about his bike. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly relevant because in that video, he talks about, basically, our friend Harry built a bike almost exclusively from parts from AliExpress. The frame, okay, the, the only parts that weren't were like the crank set and the, the handlebars at the time, there were some data ones. Pretty much everything else, oh, and the tires, pretty much everything else was from AliExpress. No, the stem was an AliExpress stem, oh, okay. which cracked after, you know, like two or three weeks, so he had to replace that with a 3T one. Anyway, he put together a bike, he raced it for two years, he's done 20,000 miles on it, he came back to the studio to do an update on that bike. We talked about it, went through all the parts. He was saying how the wheels that he got, which are made by Elite Wheels, are 20,000 miles on them. They were carbon clinchers and the brake track had worn away, basically, and started going concave and the brakes weren't working that well. Carried on racing it. And we'll put the clip in the podcast. <sighs> Oh!
I, I, I watched, I saw it on Instagram and it is a fantastic crash. Harry is fine, so we can laugh at it. It's loud, isn't it? Yeah. He hits, a, thankfully, the organisers of the crit put hay bales on the corners, which they do for a lot of um, crits. UK crits, are, they tend to be quite technical. I don't know if this one was, I never raced Ilkley, but it was wet. Uh, he was on rim brakes, carbon wheels. We know even when they're new, not the best thing in the wet. Uh, and he crashed pretty hard into a just barrier. Straight in as well. Straight into a barrier. Just, just no slowing down at all. Um, uh, do we know if it was his fault or the fault of the bike? I would. My gut is, is the wheels. If he knows that, worn. that he had already trashed the wheel, yeah. then I'm going to say that's user error. Yeah. And 20,000 miles is a, is a lot. I don't, know, I don't know how long a carbon rimmed wheel should last. I would well, they vary, but this is why good carbon rim brake wheels were so expensive and are still expensive. Like a good set is really expensive. So if you go for cheaper options, they're not made as well. And the brake track just obviously delaminates and then you're in trouble. Mm. Uh, Rob, carbon expert, the guy who does all the bike repair for carbon bike repair. I've got a clip of him talking about... Um, we, in fact, we did this a video that we posted. Eight things that shouldn't be ever be made of carbon fiber. And he honestly believes rim brakes, rim brake surfaces shouldn't be made of carbon. So, it, if I'm not mistaken, alloy braking tracks do also wear down. Oh yeah, yeah, much more. But slowly. I've never worn down a set of. Oh, I have. We used brakes. to do. We always used to have carbon racing wheels when everything was rim brake. Carbon racing wheels, and then. Alloy training, uh, alloy training wheels which is less of a thing now because everyone's on discs so they're not like ruining their nice carbon wheels mm -hmm. all winter however we would still get through a set of disc it. brakes rather than disc wheels you disc mean. brakes not not a double disc wheel uh, when you're racing no but you'd still wear through them pretty quick really yeah because it's just well, well surely not do, pretty quick yeah but doing 20 hours a week in winter in England I, I guess winter is a, is a large contract we get two, two winters out of them Really? That's still a lot of money to spend, yeah. Maybe I changed my wheels too much. Yeah, multiple sets. I mean, when I was racing on it, it was on a shoestring. You, you, were, you know, one set of okay carbon wheels, one set of crappy wheels, one bike. Mm. And it was only until I got onto teams where you'd have a, may, maybe have two bikes. And that was a big luxury. So yeah, you'd get through stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that Harry Mack is not injured. He's okay. But I don't know if the bike's all right, but he needed a new one anyway. <laughs> he shouldn't have been racing those wheels. No, no, no. So it's his fault. Yeah. Ultimately, it is your responsibility to check your equipment and you can't just blame it all on the wheel brand. Like, other carbon wheels from bigger manufacturers, I'm sure, wear out as well. 20,000 miles is a long way. That's a long way, especially in gritty conditions. It, it is, but that does say to me that that really highlights how much I do not want carbon rim brakes anymore like I, I don't want to buy a set of wheels and them to wear out at some point mm. I want them to last and that is a, that is a massive plus for disc brakes yeah 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 totally totally going back to I mean I, I have a rim brake bike one of the Scots is rim brake and that has carbon rim brakes on yeah carbon wheels they're not they don't perform very well and they're brand new within reason you know I've probably done 300 miles on it yeah they're not very good but but then you have a taste of how how powerful discs are and then you go back to that and then you realize how much difference it was. Whereas when we were racing, it's just a done thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone was on carbon wheels. Everyone had the same lag. If it was raining, everyone has that delay where you have to sort of clean off the the, the, the first layer of water and then they bite. Yeah. But yeah, going back to them now is a bit of a shock. Tour de France season has officially begun. Mm -hmm. The sun is shining. Are you going to be watching, Francis? Have you been watching, Francis? I haven't watched any yet. I will be perfectly honest. I didn't even know that it was... I've completely forgot about the Tour de France. And I can't remember what I saw. I feel like I feel like there was like something on the actual like TV news saying... About it. Uh, saying like the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. It caught me, it caught me by surprise, yeah, even I though I knew it was coming. Yeah. But um, I, the thing that excites me about it, I'm keeping it a, a bit of an eye because of the Cav thing, which is Mark Cavendish could win the most stages ever. And that is exciting. We're not going to be covering that much of the Tour de France on this podcast. We're, there are 
other podcasts that cover racing stuff much more in depth than us. So um, we're going to be, if there is some massive news, yes, we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. If Mark Cavendish, if he beats the record, definitely. Um, I'm keeping an eye. I'll watch some of the highlights, but I'm not watching it every day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, I was planning to actually watch it, but it's just, I think because it's just, I've been in such a busy block personally, I've just mm -hmm. completely missed it. But maybe I'll do a bit of catching up. Or maybe just wait until the last couple of stages when it actually gets interesting. Yeah. Something I have actually been looking at, because it interests me and because of the, the state of bike racing as a whole around the world, and particularly in the UK. But what interests me was how much do brands pay to sponsor cycling teams? Obscene amounts. Obscene amounts of money. So I have a, an actual fact here. Yeah. Ineos, the company, they spend 47 million pounds. Dollars. 47 million dollars. I'm still out of money. <laughs> to sponsor the team. It's an, ob an obscene amount of money, isn't it? Does that, is it, is it worth it? Um, for, for, for me, no. <laughs> um, I, I think, I think if the, the brand is outside of cycling, they're going to get better value than brands inside of cycling. How many of these sponsors are just, uh, it's that the, the CEOs are into cycling and they're just Spend the money. That's def money down the drain. That is definitely the case with Ineos. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the owner, what's his name? Jim Ratcliffe or something like that. He's the richest, the richest British person, hmm. like multi-billionaire. Yeah. Um, and is into cycling. Interesting. And lots of other random stuff like yachting. Mm -hmm. They also sponsor a team. Uh, he's also, I believe his company is one of the biggest polluting companies in the entire world. Lovely. Definitely in Britain. Yeah. Great. Right. Um, so I'm sure he's, well, I don't know, maybe they're trying to do a bit of green coating and going for, look what we do for green sports. Green coating, green washing. All well, that, yeah, that yeah. stuff. Jumbo Visma. Oh, no, Jum, Jum, how do they pronounce it? Jumbo. I don't think it is. I think it's actually Jumbo. From from watching the Netflix thing, I think they actually call it Jumbo. Is that right, producer Emma? I've heard it pronounced both ways. Yeah, I've heard both ways. I've always called it Jumbo. Yum, yum. I've always called it Yumbo, but I heard people calling it Jumbo on the Netflix Jumbo. thing. Uh, they, there's, they spend 20 million euros on their sponsorship, mm -hmm. which is obviously a lot of money. So I believe Yumbo Jumbo, well, that's a good name for the match, isn't it? Uh, the, 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 the people that own that company are actually mad into cycling as well, but I believe they're actually pulling out. Oh, that's a big, that's a big sponsor to come out. So. It is. It's a, a lot of, that's going to be a lot of money void. Well, producer Emily has a present for us. <laughs> She's made a quiz to test how many of the big sponsors in cycling we know, like we know what they are. Yeah. Do so you see it on the jerseys all the time? Mm -hmm. Yumbo Visma. That's one of the questions. Yes. <laughs> That's question number two. So we're going to go through some of the sponsors and figure out if we can actually tell, if we actually know what they are. Yeah. Is the sponsorship working? This is a bit of fun. We know that we're not actually the target audience for a lot of these companies and they're doing like, you know, high level global branding, sponsorship, marketing oh, stuff. Um, but it is a fun game because I am pretty confident I don't know what most of these companies <laughs> do. Uh, team number one is Ineos Grenadiers. Oil company, Jeep thing, big car. So I, I actually know, I do know this one. So the Ineos Grenadier is a car. Yeah. And it, that is the actual model name of this kind of like Land Rover. They're an oil competition. company, they make, but they make a car. Yeah. Weird. Probably because he just wanted one. Massive. Do you remember the backlash of that, that got when it was released and they all just went from Sky, which were quite, quite I think, well, as a company, fairly conscious. Maybe they're greenwashing. <laughs> Probably greenwashing. But to straight to like an oil company with a massive truck that's going to run people over. I've got a feeling that Ineos isn't an oil company. I think they're pharmaceuticals. But, but I, I, they just do loads of stuff for like chemicals and just like nasty, yeah. nasty things. I'm sure they do oil. They do. My brand was I for oil for some reason. They, they do loads of stuff because there's that. Um, they used to do the hand sanitizer stuff. Which yeah, you can and still buy branded. Because uh, yeah, I think that's just one of the things they make. Um, the answer is they are a British petrochemical company. 
and the Grenadier is a 4x4 SUV. So it's oil. Uh, I guess so. Sort of. I'll give you, I'll give you both. <laughs> I'll give you both yeah. Um, the next one is Team Yumbo Jumbo Visma. <laughs> supermarket software company. Which is the supermarket? Jump, Yumbo. Oh, is it? Jumbo, yeah. Where? Belgium. Is it Belgium? Specifically Belgium? Yeah, it's one of the, it's like a country I have raced in. <laughs> what, at like, like Tesco level or? Uh, like. Just like a big national. Yeah, big supermarket. Oh, there we go. And Visma is a software company. Definitely a software company. I don't know what type of software they make. Software. But that seems odd to like, yes. because they're, you know, that must be assuming that's probably 20 million euros as well. A lot of money. But I'm not going to like software to sell. Well, next time I need a software company, I'll give Visma a call. And the next team, Bora Hands Grower. I know this. I don't know either of those. I think it's not. It's not Campag Boras, is it? One of one of them does shower heads. Oh, I think it's Hands Grower, like like bathroom stuff. Yep. Oh, but maybe it's actually one company. Was maybe, Bora? Maybe Bora Hands Grower is actually no. It's not. I don't know. Bora, 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 Bora da is investment. Hello in Welsh. Good morning in Welsh. Hello, Bora. Morning. Investment company. Guess. And the answer is. Uh, Jimmy, you were right. Hans Grow is a German company that sells bathroom fixtures. There we go. Do showers. Bora is a German company that sells kitchen fixtures. Oh. Oh, kitchens Bora. and bathroom things. Bora. That's. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. That must cost. They must sell a lot of kitchens and bathrooms. Massive. That's massive one. For giants. Massive, giant kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Next up. EF Education Easy Post. I'm going to guess that Easy Post is like... It's Education First. That's what EF stands for. Oh, does it? Yeah. I don't know what Easy Post is. Ed education First is a charity which um, raises money for kids to get education. I'm going to guess Easy Post is a postal delivery company. Probably, probably in America. Good, um, safe guess. And the answer is... Correct. I don't know if EF is a charity. Is that correct? Mm, let's Google it. I've got, that on my, I've got that they're an education company that specialises in language. But they might be charity. I don't think it's oh, maybe it's not a charity. It specialises... It's an education company. Yeah. Okay. And you're right. Uh, Easy Post is a US-founded shipping solution. Boom! Next one. Mobi staff. Mobile phone network. Yeah. Easy. Too easy. Spain or South America? Uh, it's definitely in Spain because you see it. Yeah. You're there. How do they pronounce it? It's like Movistar. 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 Next up, Little Trek. Formerly Trek Segafredo. Bonus point if you know Segafredo. Uh, Little is obviously a food chain. Obviously. In, in Europe, I'm guessing not outside of Europe, but who knows? Maybe they're in America and other places. Um, Trek is obviously a bike brand. Uh, Seg Sega Fredo. Seg Fredo. Seg Fredo. I think that is going to be uh, Europe's largest gardening company. You're right. You said food chain, but you know, you know, a little for supermarket. Yeah. Um, Trek is bikes. Sega Fredo is flooring. Italian founded coffee company. Oh. oh. I always go with flooring because I know that at one point there's definitely a team sponsored by more than one flooring company. Just loads of flooring. Hmm. Maybe it was the same group. Like um, They might be in different names in different regions. Same company though. Yeah. Quick Step. It's flooring, isn't it? I don't know. You might have just ruined one. No, you haven't. No, I haven't. Yeah, it's fine. Um, right. Okay. The next one is... Oh, you can, I don't know. I'm not going to attempt to... Death, 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 I don't know how to say that word. Alpacin de Kooning. De Al Koenig. Al Koenig. De Koenig. Alpacin is caffeine shampoo. Shampoo stuff. Yeah. Which gets advertised. They, their marketing budget must be astronomical because it is just everywhere. Bonkers, they just give it? it out everywhere. Mm. I was quite disappointed to find out that it's not shampoo that wakes you up. It's shampoo that's supposed to make your hair grow. You could try drinking it. I wouldn't recommend it. No, not, but it would wake you up from it infusing into your head. And then giving you caffeine. Oh, okay. Yeah. But okay. it's not that. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And de, de... What did you say the next word is? De, Ker, de Kerning. I'm... I'm going to go... I'm going to take your... I'm going to say that's a flooring company. A German <laughs> flooring, flooring company. You can't steal my one. No, I've done it. I've the flooring. Well, 
I'm going flooring as well. <laughs> Can't steal my idea. De Koenig is a Belgian company that manufactures PVC windows and doors. Oh, close. Close. Lots of like manufacturing, mm. like household manufacturing. It kind of makes sense that they're sort of going for this space, but these businesses must be huge. Uh, one more. Groupama FDJ. That's well, the, that's the FDJ French. is Francais de Jeu. Which is so, uh, so Francais uh, de Jeu. De Jeu. Which is the team. De Jeu. I don't know what that Soup means. de Jeu. The day. Yeah. France, France of the day. You're stopping. No, well, well, no, I'm not cheating. Does Emily know the answer to this? Yeah, okay, so stop cheating. Okay. We've got we've got an answer. We've got an answer. Group Palmer. I don't know, that's that's investment group, surely. Group Palmer, Group Palmer. I think they are a uh, cured meats company. Mm. And that's like they all of the meat companies end with armor, so it's like salami armor, ham armor. But obviously then they go group armor what for the, the company name of the, is the group of all of the armors. You're very good at coming up with these. Um, no, Group Armour is a French insurance group, and FDJ is the French lottery. Oh. Okay. That makes sense. A little bit more sense than mine, but... There used to be a lot more Lottos sponsoring cycling. Oh, Lottos. Lotto Sudal. Mm. Lotto, Lotto. Congratulations. Yeah. I forgot to keep the score, but... So if we, tell you, <laughs> if we just quickly tally up the scores, it is... 18 points to Jimmy and 3 points to Francis. I'll take the trophy. On to the next section. You know very well what I think about the rules of cycling, the Valuminati or whatever they're called, which was a book written by someone, I don't even know who, a while ago, which was all of the rules of cycling that was written in jest. Was it a book? It was, a book. It was just a website. No, it's a book. Well, a maybe they published the book after the website. Yeah. But... Very clearly, the whole thing was written as a joke, as a bit of like comedy, as a bit of fun, but unbelievably became like a religion mm -hmm. that people like worship and belittle other people for not following the rules. Like there's, there's literally businesses that exist that are called like rule something or other, which is referencing one of the rules. Mm -hmm. Like that's the actual like business name, like... It's just bonkers. It's incredibly elitist. Yep. Did you see what a clothing brand DHB posted on their social media? I did. It's a little video running through the crimes of cycling and with a very confusing message, which didn't come across well. And it got a lot of backlash. And they went through stuff like stupid things, like wearing your sunglasses in or outside of your helmet straps. Yep. Sock length, um, rolling wearing, up your sleeves, rolling up your sleeves, which is I do that all the time, um, and refer to them as crimes, crimes, which is presumably leaning on the rules thing, isn't it? But the, the end of the video was like, we don't care about any of this stuff. But the start oh, of it is like, the, the end of the video is actually suggest more crimes in the comments in the below. Section below. But then the caption, which perhaps is an adjusted caption, we'll never know. But the caption was then saying exactly that: the we don't. We don't care about the rules, but suggest some more Clark crimes below. Yeah, they got some backlash for that. Rightly and, so. But I feel like this is the, the fact that there is backlash is people have now reached a point where no one cares. Like, but, no but, one cares. It, but some of the comments were adding things like wonky helmets, unshaved legs, which is again going into the space of the rules. Was, I bet someone said no bloody saddle bag or something. Mm. Like the problem is the stupid shit like that. It does stop people from getting into the sport. It does. Yeah, it's a, it's a barrier. People go, oh, why why would I want to do this thing that loads of other people are so snobby about? And Yeah, it, it creates this idea that you have to do a particular thing or be a particular way before you can yeah. start. Yeah, right? totally. And if you've done it for a while, like I 100% I I'm brainwashed, have been brainwashed by the culture because... I always wear long socks. I pretty yeah. I have, I feel like when I do an event, I pr probably shave my legs. Um, I always wear my sunglasses outside of my helmet straps consciously. And if I wanted to not do it, I'd have to think about it and actually, mm. you know, brainwashed, totally brainwashed. There are there, yeah. There's a lot. When I started riding, it did feel like you had to do certain things. Mm. And the more I ride, the less I do that. Like I don't shave my legs anymore. Nah. 
which which has actually been something like quite weird getting used to. Because I like, I look down, I'm like, oh, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't but, feel right, especially when you wear leg warmers. <laughs> we talked about this last week. But I think I think for me now that I consider myself a recreational cyclist is that like the thing I hate most about road cycling is tan lines. Mm. So I'm always pushing my socks down. I'm always rolling my sleeves up. I'm always looking at ways of making my tan lines less horrible. And that is breaking the rules to do that. Moving to Newcastle. That's a, that is a good method. It's a well, good method. Well, I don't know. The, the sun does shine you quite a bit. Mm. It might be cold. But it doesn't work, shine. though. It's shining, but it doesn't actually make tan you. Well, in winter, it does in summer. I've not been outside in the northeast. Look at me. Fantastically tanned. As tanned as you. Yep, same color as the shirt. That's ridiculous. For people listening, I'm wearing a white t-shirt. <laughs> and Jimmy's arms are also white. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Literally, as brown as you. Because I've been here for ages, lost it. <laughs> you're, you're, the sun doesn't work. You're off your head. The sun does not work. DHB later did clear things up in the comments saying that it was meant to be a joke and that they were just sharing what they hear out on the road rather than what they actually believe. Did it come from a place of that they their hearts are in the right place and they've just made a mess up? Yes. I, th I, th I think I think yeah, they've definitely. tried to make something that is going to get attention. No. And they've done it in a way that uh, encourages elitism. It's a shame. Mm. It is interesting. On the flip side, or, well, I guess this is an example of people being brainwashed by this kind of thing. I've had two people ride with me who are fairly new to cycling and ask me point blank at the start, um, how do I like? Give me the give me the rules. Let me know because they've done other sports. They've done skiing or whatever, mm -hmm. and they know there's certain ways to wear that things should be worn and things should be done. The the you know how do I wear this certain thing or what color kit should I wear and that kind of stuff. They've asked me point blank, run me through those things. And I've hoped what so even how like this for there aren't they don't exist. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I've got, it doesn't matter. I th I think what. If if someone asked if someone asked me that those kind of questions, I would be talking about stuff that makes their experience better, that they're more likely to keep doing it. Yeah. So stuff like I would suggest someone wears cycling shorts because they're probably gonna have a better experience. So they might not even be thinking about getting cycling shorts because they might just wear I don't know running shorts or something rather. Mm -hmm. um, or or something to consider is like you know eat enough food. Um, oh yeah, big time. People forget that. Also. Do do I have to do this? Like, if if someone's saying like, what what color kit should I wear? What color? What what's like the in color of kit? Then I'll be like, wear whatever you want. Or if someone says, do I need? Do can I wear a short sleeve top? Yeah, of course you can. Whereas like, the rules or the the etiquette within cycling says no, you should wear a, a long sleeve jersey and you should wear this and you should wear that. Long sleeve jersey. Uh, like a one with sleeves rather than like a vest. Oh, like a sleeveless. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. I remember when I used to go and ride in uh, in France, the locals would often wear like gilets mm -hmm. as as their like outerwear. Uh, and I think like people like Mario Cipollini is like famous for that. He has no rules, surely. Oh, he has no rules. <laughs> But again, I know questionable rule. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to talk. He goes about too him. far, too far. <laughs> um, but like. There, there, there isn't, in, in my opinion, there should never be a, like, you should or should not do. But there can be things where you can help someone make it more enjoyable mm. or a better experience. Like, like stuff like, get a helmet. Like, it might be safer if you wear a helmet, so why not? I have a minefield. Let's go to that one. <laughs> Bad example. I was, I was going to say, uh, I was thinking about, like, I personally would recommend someone that's, like, getting into cycling properly that they get like spds or SP or like road cleats but you don't need them like no. if, if i went out a ride with someone and they had flat pedals as long as it was like it wasn't going to be doing sprints then there's no bother i've no got one up. which i would recommend um some sort of glasses yeah and i don't need to be expensive ones yeah just something to not get one one shit in your eyes two if you can get something in your i know i remember um Magnus Baxter, yeah, winner of Paris Roubaix, Flanders, really nice guy. Um, we were in South Africa together, did some riding, and uh, I didn't have glasses on. And he was like, 
put your glasses on, mate. I'm like, what? Like, what? And he's like, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen people get something is just like flicked into their eye, it's got infected, and they've gone, like, lost their vision. Mm-hmm. And it's just not worth that. Plus hay fever, <laughs> we yeah. talked about earlier. It's like getting stuff in your eyes is really annoying. So, so that's a very cheap, easy suggestion. For exactly. People. That is a great piece of advice for someone says, what should I consider? Mm. Wear glasses. I'm intrigued. We were, for uh, the preparation of another video that we've, we're planning, we went to an optician mm-hmm. the other day and she was talking a little bit and I'd like to know more about the benefits of sunglasses when it is really sunny, other than the obvious, which yeah. is you can see more easily. But I think the in terms of like eye health, it's, a, it's quite a serious thing. Yeah. So we'll find out more for that. A, t- uh, a great thing to tell someone that's getting into cycling is what puncture, what repair stuff they need to have and teach them how to change a flat tire, yeah. assuming they're not due. But this is the important stuff as people should be focusing on. Focusing on, mm. and, they're, and they're not. They're focusing on stuff like this, made worse by Socks. stuff like this from DHB. So thanks, DHB. On to the big question of the day. If you knew everything you knew now, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? I do know everything I know now. Yeah. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Knowing everything you know now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, on what, what subject? Just in anything. general? Anything. Oh, wow. This is, this is... You can make it cycling if you want. Should we start? Cycling was a big, a big part of my life when I was 20. Should we start with cycling? Let's start with cycling. Yeah, sure. My advice to my 20-year-old self would be start cycling. <laughs> Fair enough. So I was you. You weren't cycling when you were twenty. No, I was. I was. I was. All, I was like kind of fit. I played a lot of football. Finished playing rugby that uh, by that point because I was five foot seven. Yeah, and, and used to get injured a lot. Yeah, because everyone else was big. So I started playing football, mm-hmm. which I used to do quite a bit. And I enjoyed. I was all right at it. Yeah. Um. And, well, at 20, I was like peak musician. Yeah. So I was actually doing the fun stuff whilst you were trying to be a boring cyclist. I was being a boring cyclist. So when I was 20, I was an elite racing cyclist in the UK. My advice to myself, cycling-based, would have been leave the UK. Don't bother. No, not at all. (laughs) No, 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 definitely not. Like I I think in, in lots of circumstances, the guys I was racing against have had a great time. And they're still having a great time. Some of them got really far in the sport. Um, Teo, for example, he was racing when I was, and now he rides for the biggest team. He's he's a lot. He's having a terrible time at the moment because he's got a broken uh, hip or leg. But usually he's having a great time. He must be a younger lot than younger me. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of years. A couple of years. Is it that close? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he he would have been a junior when I wasn't under twenty three. Uh, but I would have left. So I was less than sixty kilos. A lot of the time when I was racing, mm-hmm. um, I'm probably 67 now, 68, maybe even more. Um, so super skinny, little guy, great FTP. So I was fitter than a lot of other people as I was, I was racing against. My race craft wasn't very good, but there, if you're little and you have a high FTP, it doesn't really get you anywhere. In, it doesn't get you that far in England because the climbs are short enough for the sprinters to get over mm-hmm. and the powerhouses to get over you need a longer climb so really i should have gone to france i should have gone to spain and done some racing there um ridden some mountains and the a- again the standard of riding there is so high that you have to get good at bunch racing um so i think that would have been a nice sort of springboard and a way into into that kind of racing but did you want to be a professional cyclist yeah you, yeah, yeah at the time yeah but do you look but is that the advice you would give yourself do you look back now and go like actually yeah i should have been a professional cyclist and that's something i would still wish i had done i don't know if i was in like teo's position now it would be a different path but i would be very happy if i got to that kind of situation even if i didn't reach that the, the that level because he's he won the giro <laughs> like it's really really good but if i was a domestique and i was racing you know maybe the Vuelta or something like that. Brilliant. I'd be very happy with my life, I think. However, I'm very happy with my life now. If I was going to give non-cycling advice to my 20-year-old self, it would be start a YouTube channel then. Did it exist? Yeah. 
and the guys who got in then How long has YouTube uh, been were, were able to make absolutely anything really creative stuff and and as long as it's all really good. uncreative and it'll still do well <laughs> nice stuff uh harry bit charlie bit my finger <laughs> what are you gonna go i thought you were gonna That's say charlie is so cool like he was one of the british youtubers that yeah charlie bit my finger but that was there was some like but that viral videos like that happen now still where it's just like a one-off big thing but youtubers were able to really make obscure genre new genres and experiment with stuff and generally it did quite well yeah uh and and there were less people doing it so i think it would have been an exciting and interesting pathway as well yeah uh not cycling based but yeah i I think the only reason i would tell myself to start cycling at the age of 20 is not any not for performance at all it's just it's just a really good hobby Mm -hmm. and i think i would have done i would have commuted more and done more things about bikes but to be fair i got into bikes when i was like 25 so it's not that much difference really no extra five years it's cool isn't it it teaches you so much stuff Mm. like you learn how to build things and work on things and socialize with people you wouldn't have otherwise and it teaches you about persistence and consistency and whatever you're doing in life but i i don't i I don't even care about that kind of stuff Mm. i i just like i used to walk a lot so like you know, I, 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 I struggle with walking. You like Not the actual, no, 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 not the, not the physical act of walking. The, uh, if I go to the shop or if I go for a haircut in the town near me, I take my running shoes, I'll run there and back. Right. Because I cannot bear walking. That's weird. I have to be in a very specific, like, okay, maybe if I'm on holiday mm. and that, like, with calm mindset, I can go for a walk. But most of the, my time... No way. So I, way too highly strong. I'm just like, mm, why am I going so slowly? I wish I was on a bike or running. So I grew up in Cardiff. My college, for so I used to walk to school from the age of like 12 because we lived close enough. It was like a mile. Mm. Then I went to St. David's College. Shout out to St. David's. Uh, that was probably... Great place. That was like... That was probably <laughs> three or four miles. And I used to walk. I used to take about 40 minutes... It was about 40, 50 minute walk. And I used to just walk that all the time. Not all the time, but quite a bit. Mm. We used to go out on the lash in Cardiff. And walk home. And walk home. Yeah, we, I used walk, to do that. Yeah, when I was a bit younger. We would walk to town, yeah. which would have been like seven, six or seven miles. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Drinking on the way. Yeah. Go out and then walk home at like three in the morning. Yeah, we don't want to waste your money, do you? Well, it wasn't even about that. It was just, we just like walking. Oh, we did it to not waste money. We'd go, you, you know, I had a mate who lived in, well, how long's the walk between che- like, far end of Chessington and Kingston, which are two towns. So like Kingston was where we go out. Chessington is where he lived. I'm sure it was about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half walk. And he'd do that whole walk after like 3 a.m. All right, yeah. see you later, guys. I walked the first bit with him. And went, Bye. So you, so you did like walking. But anyway, my point is, I used to do a lot of walking and it probably would have been good if some of that was on a bike. <laughs> Much easier. <laughs> Although I, I used to, so I used to basically just put like, oh, going out check this out. I'll ride a bike. You probably don't even know what this is. I used to, put my mini disc on and then I would listen to I remember on the way is you're not that much older <laughs> only because you saw it in a museum no I've got one it's only one I've still got it um, and I used to have a tape player before that a Walkman actual Walkman you got in a charity shop for my dad gave cool. it to me and I used to listen to there was a band called the Hamsters and I also had the uh, the, the best rock album in the world ever and it, the logo on the front was at oh, Earth just exploding like a rock, third rock from the sun. Oh, that's, that, that seems familiar. It's on Spotify. Someone's made it, yeah. a, a playlist of it. So link down below, guys. <laughs> and I had that on the cassette and it was two. I think it was two cassettes in one thing. And you just have to change them and wind it and stuff. Yeah. Brilliant. In terms of life, in terms of advice to myself at 20, um, having uh, not about cycling stuff, I think there's probably two bits I would give myself. Number one would be learn a trade, get an apprenticeship. I've always thought of that. I've always thought like the way my mind works, I should have I should have done a trade. Instead of you went to uni? I went to uni for one year studying law and then I dropped out because I wanted to be a rock star. Yeah. Cool. And then I and then I did I was basically a professional music, mu- musician for like Twelve months. Bearing in mind, I'd been in a band That's why you're trying to achieve that. Yeah, exactly. I'd been in a band trying to achieve that for probably three or four years before that. So basically, was at the age that you were trying to be 
a really good bike racer. I was trying to be a really good musician. Uh, then I was basically. Did we, did we get to the same sort of level? You made you actually made a living from it. Oh God, no! No one makes a living from that. <laughs> so we both, so we both got to the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like as good as you can get without making any money. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah. Um, and then and then when I realised that this was a very bad place to be at the age of like twenty twenty one, that you basically have no income, and. Uh, well, you, you get a little bit of income from doing a little bit of work here and there, and there's no realistic opportunities. I then fell into other stuff, but I think I should have done. I should have done other stuff. Other stuff. Yeah, not dodgy stuff. Oh, okay. It's well, it, well, it isn't dodgy, but it's 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 kind of like a blessing and a curse. Mm. I fell into finance. Oh, yeah, exactly. Not drug dealing. No, yeah. no, it's not my scene. Um, but yeah, I trade. I should have learned trade. Mental health advice. Two, two, two bits for me on this. Yeah. I wish I had got therapy much sooner. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had the patience to understand the value of meditation. And I'd started doing that at the age of 20. Why did you go to therapy? Uh, because I had my third nervous breakdown at the age of, by the age of 37. What was do you attribute to that uh partly my brain in that it is it's it never shuts off uh partly working continuously for about five years mm -hmm. with no rest no holidays and attri attributed again to my brain not knowing how to stop working so even when i'm resting i'm not actually resting i'm my head my brain is still working um historically um and trying to grow a business has meditating helped that then yes massively well for me anyway this is the thing i i committed to it because i didn't have an option i had to commit i had to teach myself new skills because i was 37 and i had the third nervous breakdown in my life mm -hmm. like you, you have like you can't get to that point and and, and just be like well I'll just keep doing this every every few years. Um, so I committed to meditation because I, I responded quite well to it. Um, just using the Headspace app and just trying to do it as much as I can. Um, and the two the two things that I get from that personally is I now notice when I'm working too much. I notice when I'm my nervous system is elevating. I I notice when I'm getting stressed, and then I have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I have bigger self awareness. Yeah, and then and then I have sk like tools and skills to be able to then like not for that to not become like a, a, an issue that keeps growing. Mm. And the other thing that I'm learning, which is the hardest bit, is how to get my brain to relax, mm -hmm. how to actually like rest, how to uh, have an evening where I'm, my brain isn't just focusing on work and actually it's kind of doing the stuff it wants to do and having a bit of, of, of calm and relaxation. Yeah. That's what I've got from both of those things, therapy and, and meditation. I find getting into that state of relaxation quickly, like in short bursts, yeah. almost impossible. The, the reason I've survived, so I've done YouTube, like worked extremely hard at YouTube for seven years and the only reason I think I've been okay is because all of that was interspersed with very long bikepacking trips. Mm -hmm. And on those trips, okay, I'll do a little bit of work in the evenings. Like I put together a video that's creating something that's good, but I'm not absorbing information all day. And the whole time you're on the bike, it's very, it's very good for your brain. Whereas if I think I'm at home, just working like this for extended periods of time, I would be in trouble. I'd have to do things like that. But I don't let I don't let you work too much now, because <laughs> I refuse to work too much. <laughs> True. I'll send you messages and you'll be like, "It's the weekend." <laughs> Speak to me. Oh, they're all like sick. The podcast clip, like, <laughs> lovely weekend. <laughs> all I've done is just sat in a different place. It's not work if I'm sat at home. Yeah, well, it's fine. Yeah, it's not true, but okay, it's fine. Fluff up of the week. It works every time. There's a, there's a, there isn't actually one specific one. There's lots of little ones. Uh, I forgot my laptop today, so I'm using Emily's one, partly because I left it at my new house. 
Um, we did a very extensive mic test. Sennheiser loaned us a load of microphones, which was in our last Mailbox Monday video, and all of them didn't work very well for us. Um, boxes. The studio is full of boxes of mine. It's, it's, it's a, it does help the audio. Cloud has a silver lining. The audio is better. <laughs> Full of boxes. And we were, after recording this, going to go and finish one of our other videos, which required me to be in cycling kit, and I forgot that as well. So actually... The man I, who owns a cycling kit brand has yeah. no cycling kit. Yeah. I took... This is a, this is a piece of advice for, that I've always given myself mm -hmm. from a film that I watched, which I can't remember which one it was, and they were... It was a drug dealer talking to a, a, a prospective drug dealer, and he said, never smoke your own stash. And that's how I apply business that's how i approach business if i just kept taking kit from my company there'd be no kit left and i would have a lot of kit it's time for another round of overrated or underrated i'm going to read out a list of things and you're going to tell me if they're overrated or underrated i think this section is underrated oh, savage no no oh, wait no underrated. that's good that's yeah good. yeah yeah you think i'd know this by now <laughs> protein shakes uh i think they are overrated because there aren't that many people that actually need protein shakes. I agree. How, I mean, it's convenient. Do you mean protein shake or do you mean recovery shake? Because I get like a recovery shake after a ride, kind of beneficial if you're going to be riding the next day. However, if it's protein specifically, I think it would be better if people treated iron the way they treat protein, because that's what more people are deficient of than protein. In fact, is there even a term for protein deficiency? No, it doesn't, doesn't exist because if you're getting enough calories, you're probably getting enough protein. But putting a little bit in, it's like you want to do five to one or four to one carbs to protein after a ride. So an actual protein shake on its own. Or just have a meal. Or that, yeah. You know, have a, have a tuna sandwich. Far less important if you're not riding the next day. Bib shorts with pockets. Underrated. Underrated. They're quite I mean, well you know, there's a reason why everyone's starting to use them because it's where you having a pocket. I mean, that's where your pockets are. In normal life, we really enclosed with, with Atticus. We've only done pocketed shorts this year. Really? Yeah. Like, with, it's so why not? So why wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. So bit for viewers at home, that's like cargo shorts. I guess they're called Ad is it adventure shorts. So we, we call them adventure shorts. Adventure yeah. shorts. Yeah. Car cargo is just a raffer term. Is it? A lot of people use it because they cargo brought it to market. Didn't someone do a cargo helmet? Oh, and a little bag on the side. Box Hill. Oh, but I don't want to give it an unfair... Is like, the most overrated, overrated climb in Surrey, which featured in the 2012 Olympics. This section is unfair because it has... Well, okay, we're choosing overrated or underrated. Can I just say this? It's only slightly overrated. It's not. Just a tiny little bit. No, because it's cool. It's got switchbacks and everything. It's massively overrated. I've ridden it a million times, so it's not, it's not it's, exciting it's anymore. It's really not a climb. Chris, Chris, didn't Chris Everest on it and have to do it like five yeah, million so times? times. Because yeah, could you bad. get like four four meters of elevation on each climb? Overrated. Okay, fine. <laughs> Only slightly though. Only slightly. It's got squiggly things on the rear, like iconic. Micro shift. Underrated. Underrated. I think it's great. Great group set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, oh, the group set parts nowadays are all getting so, so good. And Microshift is a perfect example of it. Mm -hmm. It's found on, um, you know, you either get like lower end Shimano or Microshift on a lot of the commuter bikes and road bikes in Halfords. And the Microshift one's actually really, really good. Kickstands. I think a kickstand is underrated. I'd like one. Would you? Hmm. Just be that guy. Put my bike anywhere. I, I, I'd like. I wonder if there is. If anyone knows, let me know. But I would like there to be like a click. You know where you can attach where like you want high end carbon. Where you want one is bike packing. The amount of times you can't lean your bike on something because it's really big and massive and heavy, and like you have to lift it up a stone it like outside a gas station. You could just go. That would be amazing. Or just any other occasion, just get done. But how well would it have to be? It would need to be a certain quality to prop up a 30 kilogram bike. It would. Mm -hmm. Let's look at they exist. Underrated. Greg's sausage rolls. Underrated. So Greg's is a British 
national confectionery and bakery company. One of the few British, like only only found in Britain. And they have, they are a Geordie company based in Newcastle, mm. but are absolutely everywhere. Yeah, yeah. They do a meat sausage roll, and they famously do a, a vegan, vegan sausage, sausage roll. roll. Um, I haven't had a Greg's meat sausage roll for probably a decade. I don't think I've ever had one. I don't believe you. And I have had the vegan one on numerous occasions, and they're delicious. Mm -hmm. The only issue with them is that you get a discount if you buy four. So I always buy four and then eat four. Why is that an issue? Then I feel sick. Just don't eat them all in one go. Impossible. You're the problem, not the, not the sausage roll. Well, user error. It's like Harry's wheels. Clearly, clearly underrated then if it's impossible for you to not eat four and a go. Oh, underrated. And they're that good. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Underrated. Next up is listeners takeover. Question from Alexander. I currently ride in running shoes. Are cycling shoes worth getting? Do they increase power output and stuff like that? Ah, oh, it's actually quite a tough one. Um, do you need cycling shoes? No. No. Uh, will if you use them, will you always want to use them forever going forward? Probably. Mm. Uh, th I think what I like about cycling shoes is the full rotation. Just you just feel connected to it, and you feel connected to the bike. I think there's studies, plenty of studies out there, which actually say you don't get that much additional power, additional, especially if you're. It's a steady effort. If it, if it's a steady effort, you're. There's a. Do you remember the guy who did the national, 24 hour yeah. national TT and yeah. he does it in flat shoes every single time? And he's he podiums. Um, he podiums it. Experienced cyclist, so he's putting his feet in the right place, which I think is a big factor here. Like if you have SPDs, um, cycling shoes with a clip on and they are clipped into the correct place on your shoes, every single time you then clip in, you're in the right position. Yeah. If you put your feet too far forwards, you can cause yourself problems. If you feet too far back, it causes yourself problems. So if you're riding flat pedals for a long period of time and you don't really know where your feet should be, I guess that's where issues come up. I, I, it comes uh, down if you're, to- If you're in a bike race and you're sprinting, forget about it. We, it's, you need it's a requirement, pedals. isn't it? For racing. Uh, in some- Governing bodies, yes. In others, no. I think I'm I, one of my friends, a French guy, did a crit, and he forgot his shoes, and he just did it in trainers. So there's definitely races in the world where you could. I don't know about British cycling, but you can definitely race with flat pedals. I used, in some races. I used to go to a triathlon camp in France, and the cycling dude there, Mark Shaw, he wouldn't let you sprint if you, even if you had SPDs, you had to have road cleats, and the reason for it was. If you haven't, if it's anything other than a road cleat, you're more likely to pull your foot out, which means you are more likely to crash and then injure other people. If you have them done up the way you do, then that's true. Yeah, like normal people, not like, like nice and loose and it's too loose. So I think if 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 someone's sprinting and doing like efforts, cleats are a good idea. Uh, if Alexander, if you generally are just commuting and and riding relaxed, you don't need something. Nah, issues. don't feel the pressure. They're not going to make you faster. Nah. Question from Alfie. I've recently transitioned to tubeless with all the hype, but I've had a lot of issues of punctures not sealing and tubeless plugs flying out due to high pressures, 65 PSI. It's a bloody nightmare when this happens on the side of the road as I get me and my bike unbelievably messy when putting a tube in. Don't know if I've been unlucky or it's just not ready for higher pressures. Uh, road, tubeless, I assume 65 PSI. Sometimes there's problems. Try some different sealant. Unfortunately, it just it just doesn't work as well as um, gravel, gravel tires or mountain large tires, tires, which work really well on their low pressure, and they, the, the holes tend to seal. Uh, I rode road tubeless across America, or started with it, and I definitely sealed a bunch of punctures before. Then eventually, puncturing, I had to put a tube in, and then I replenished it like halfway through at a bike shop with new tires, new sealant, and then it lasted it again right to the end, and I had lots of little punches that sealed so it worked for me great i was using like the bond treasure sealant uh the second time uh the first time i was using stands standard sealant not the race sealant um apparently the silica sealant is amazing and seals holes incredibly well in road tires as well however certain types of rim tape 
it aggravates and will cut into because of pieces of carbon fiber inside the ceiling. There, there does still seem to be s certain tire and wheel combos that don't work as well as others. And I th in terms of the puncturing, though, that's not really no. In, in, in terms of like the feeling and getting yeah. it set up, yeah. So I generally, for road, I've never even bothered with tubeless. I just stick to tubes. Yeah. I, ge I generally don't puncture that often anyway. So I'm, that that's that's my preference. Yeah, there's definitely some wheels that are wheels and tire combos that just don't work. Don't work. Whereas there's uh, like Parkour and Hutchinson, which is the two people that sponsor us. We've been very lucky that it. They d inflate without any sealant in. You can just put them on, and sometimes with a normal pump, it's crazy. But they, Hutchinson invented mountain bike tubeless years ago, so they know what they did. If you have a question or story, send it to wildonespodcast at cademedia.co.uk. That's all for this episode. If you watch the podcast on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you're listening and you like this ep episode, please follow and leave us a review. It really helps us out. Goodbye. Bye. Got no in outro music this time. <laughs>